you might not like it, but in this video I will prove to you that traders are actually professional gamblers. While you're listening to all of these speakers, I really suggest you try and draw connections with trading. And you might actually be very surprised. And let me know your favorite one in the comments and I'll pin the best comment. And if you're looking for a backtested and proven strategy, apply to the mentorship in the description. All right, let's hear what our first scientist has to say about expert gamblers. Not all gamblers are fools. Some of them are experts. And I think we can all learn a lot about how to make better decisions by studying the way these expert gamblers think. Surely gambling is just a matter of luck, they say. But that's not true. Sure, slot machines and roulette are games of pure chance, so there's no room for expertise there. But poker, blackjack, and all kinds of sports betting op offer the opportunity to exercise skill and expertise. Expert gamblers outperform novices in these games, and their expertise can make them very rich. And it's this ability to earn money, to earn a profit from gambling that sets the expert gamblers apart from the problem gamblers and the leisure gamblers. The problem gamblers and the leisure gamblers both lose money over the long term. But it's not really the money these people are playing for in the end. It's more the thrill of winning, the adrenaline rush of the game. With the expert gamblers, things are very different. For them, it really doesn't thrill them that much to win. Think of it, if every time you pulled the arm of a slot machine, it paid out, soon it wouldn't be fun. It would be work. And for these gamblers, these expert gamblers, it is more of a cold, rational pursuit of profit that motivates them. That and a certain degree of intellectual satisfaction. When they look at a roulette table or a blackjack game, and ex the expert gamblers don't see the maximum amount that they could win or lose. They're not hypnotized by this like the rest of us. They just see the average amount that they could win or lose per bet, the expected value. That's what really is at the forefront of their mind. And by placing their decisions, as it were, in the con in, in, by thinking about this decision in this way, in the terms of expected value, they place their decisions in the context of a much longer time horizon. If you think this is the last race, the last roll of the dice, you might bet everything on it. The expert gamblers, in a sense, by seeing things in a much longer time horizon, almost act as if they were immortal. And because of that, they kind of gain a certain coolness about their decision making. They can take it or leave it. As one expert gambler told me, there's always another race. I don't have to bet my bank roll on this throw of the die or this horse race now. I can come back tomorrow. And it's when knowing when not to bet that is really one of the crucial things that sets the experts apart from the leisure gamblers, the problem gamblers. Do you have any idea what your edge was? Well, so that's the thing about sports betting is you can never really exactly quantify your edge. You can quantify it based on my own projection. So I did build a crude model of basically when the weather is this, this is the historical outcome. Oh, yeah, outcome sure. You can in, back test it. Yes, yeah, and you can find it, it's baseball. There's stats for everything, right? So. I could quantify it pretty well with my own model, but that's not like a 52 card deck and blackjack where you know exactly to the hundredth of percent what your edge is. So I think I had about a 10 to 20% edge on this bet on most of the bets I was making. Um, and when you have that big of an edge and you're really, it's not a high variance thing because it's minus, it was, I think it was minus 120 on either side. Uh, so you, you have to basically hit 54 and a half percent in order to break even. And you can do this to all these bets, mm -hmm. such as that home run bet. So I would have this, uh, this crude model and I would project out how many home runs there would be. And then I would apply this Poisson distribution and figure out exactly what that probability was. Now I'm a, I was a card counter at the time. So I'm all into probability. I'm all into like, okay, if I have an exact 57.3% 
probability, then I know my edge is this, and that's a you know 7.2% edge. I will bet 7.2% of my bankroll. Then that's where sports kind of varies, kind of veers away from card counting. Is you you can't fully quantify your edge. I'm basing it on my projection. I'm not basing it on a 52 card deck. So yes, it was a. It, but that, that was so. Getting back to your original question. That was where I started to kind of learn things. I learned from Stanford Wong's book. I learned uh, how to build my own models. I learned uh, how to network with other people and kind of learn what they're doing. And, you know, it wasn't so much like, hey, I'm doing this to beat the NFL. It was like, hey, the NFL's really tough, but I'm over here. I'm betting college football. That's easier. And I go, oh, maybe I should look at college football. It's sort of like that first time when you're networking with other APs and you start to learn they're doing something different. They're playing a different game. And you're like, well, why are they playing that? And then you learn, oh, you can get an edge in that game. I didn't realize that. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to thank Blue Guardian for sponsoring this video. Myself and many other traders I know are adding Blue Guardian to their portfolio. They have an almost perfect rating on Trustpilot. And I personally love their two steps unlimited challenge and their very competitive 85% profit split. And I'll give you an advice with them. Make sure to join their Discord before buying a challenge. You should be able to find a discount code there. And if you can find one, just use mine, Money Engineer. So check them out with the link in the description. And many of these people who are successful, people like Bill Benza, soon became pretty well known in the world of casinos and found themselves banned from all the way around the world. Um, so they turned their attention into a bigger game, a much uh, sort of larger place to wager. Now this uh, is Happy Valley Racecourse in Hong Kong. If you've ever been, Wednesday night, this is kind of where all the action is. On a typical race day, about $150 million are wagered. Gambling is an enormous part uh, of what's going on here. And all the appeals for this for gamblers is it's a fairly small, um, well, firstly, it's, it, they're pretty convinced it's an, you know, it's an honest operation, and it's a small pool of ho horses, about 1,000 horses that run again and again and again. So you can generate lots of data uh, to look at and try and interpret which horse might have a good chance. But to do that, of course, you need some way of converting data into a measure of performance. Which horse is the best? Which horse is going to win? And we could say, well, let's just suppose this box is the performance of the horse, and we have lots of different bits of past data. And we could say, well, maybe each one of these bits of data explains some amount of the horse's performance. Of course, this is a bit simplistic, really, isn't it? Because just like with um, the characteristics of inheritance, where, for instance, some of the variation explained by the parents are also going to be shared with the grandparents, the characteristics of the horse, these features are going to overlap. Some of these will explain multiple aspects. So these kind of things are going to be a bit more jumbled up. And what's more, we might not be able to explain all of the horse's performance. There might be some chunk which we still can't explain. I mean, the aim from a statistical point of view is to try and minimize uh, this unknown quantity. And it was actually um, in the 80s, Bill Benter, a visiting library in Nevada, came across a paper by two researchers called Ruth Bolton and, and Randall Chapman. They work in marketing. Um, they still do, actually. And they had essentially outlined this method for horse races, this approach of converting data into some kind of measure of performance that you could use to make predictions. Now, in doing the analysis, there's early syndicates in Hong Kong, certain things would come out as more important. For example, in one of their early um, bits of research, the number of races a horse had run would tell you a lot about how it was going to do. And it's tempting to come up with a story for that. We say, well, if it's run more races, then it's going to be more experienced, and then that's going to give it a better performance in the next race. But they actually avoid doing that because really they know it's a jumble, that all of these things are kind of going to overlap and explain one thing. And it's not clear that just because something's important, it has a direct uh, explanation. This is quite a common problem in statistics. It's known as this idea that uh, correlation doesn't always mean causation. And really these syndicates uh, therefore don't try and untangle it. And actually one of the remarkable things is they have no desire to be pundits and experts on, on this kind of field. For them, the question is what horse is going to win, not why is that horse going to win. So it's almost this, going back to the idea of ignorance, they're embracing their ignorance and they're saying, yeah, I, I don't really mind that I can't explain exactly how it's going. I just want a method that is going to give me good predictions. Now, if you're a young man and you're trading, check out this compilation I made of trading psychologists talking about the biggest challenges young men face nowadays to become full-time traders. Like and subscribe and see you there.